Get more confidence. Get that promotion. Get moving up the corporate ladder. Get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu. And Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Ben Wiggins, your sometime host, and I'm here with today's host, the amazing, the splendiferous Dr. Shannon Deer. I like splendiferous. That's a good one. I've actually been writing a bunch of adjectives in my phone lately so that I can I can throw them at you in the future. I'm excited. I look forward to that. And it it is also a beautiful day in Aggieland. It is a beautiful day in Aggieland. It's good to be here. So who's on the show today? Today, we have Masrur Fatani, who has served as CEO of AYG Food Services, DBA, the Halal Guys, since 2014, where he is currently responsible for the overall brand and operational management of the greater Houston area. Prior to this role, he was CEO of Sears Home Improvement Products. In 2012, he was awarded the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Houston Award by the U.S. Small Business Administration. He holds a Master of Business in Finance, a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Mays, and is a licensed certified public accountant in the state of Texas. Excellent. We hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get into it. Looking forward to hearing your interview, Dr. Deer. I loved it. He was amazing. It is great to have you here, Mr. Rohr. What? Uh, how was your weekend? It was great. Uh, spent some time with the family here in Dallas. So great time with the kids. So it was excellent. Good, good. And we start each episode with some team building questions. So tell us, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas. My parents came to Houston when I was two, so I've been, been in Houston pretty much my whole life. Growing up, uh, I'm the oldest of three. I've got two younger sisters and my parents. Give us 60 seconds on your career story. So graduated from a and with the PPA program, undergrad in accounting, master's in finance, started at Ernst & Young, picked that firm out of the big four at the time just just connected with a lot of the people during that interview process out of ppa worked there for a little over a year um but this was kind of the time where the 2008 2009 crisis was happening and uh kind of made me reflect i was moving around different teams and my father was the one that kind of encouraged me that hey maybe you should look at something else something more entrepreneurial my mom saw an ad in the Houston Chronicle in the newspaper for Sears Garage Doors. They were offering franchises and it just, you know, I told her, I was like, I'm a CPA. I'm not going to sell garage doors. But circumstances changed at work that made me look into it. Went off. I was 24 at the time. Went to Columbus, Ohio, where Sears was based out of and did a deal to buy the rights to Houston, started with a phone and a desk behind one of my dad's stores and, you know, took it from there. We grew it, ended up in New York at one point with my wife, saw the halal guys first time, started and then got into the restaurant business and now working on lanes as the next restaurant concept within our portfolio. Wow, that's amazing. It's uh, interesting to hear how a newspaper ad, right? First of all, not many people may read actual newspapers now, but how that really changed the course of your career. It did. Yeah, it was an ad in the Chronicle that that I wasn't really thrilled about, but just kind of happened that way that you know, uh, made me look into it. And uh, yeah, that was my first entrepreneurial effort. A lot of our students feel like their entrepreneurial effort has to be something they are incredibly passionate about. 
And I think that's a little bit of a, a little bit misguided. We have a lot of entrepreneurs on the show who, especially their first idea, was not necessarily something they were passionate about. It was just something they knew there was a market need for. Yeah. I mean, Sears at the time was, I would say, I think if I'm remembering correctly, 60% of garage doors in America had craftsmen, garage door openers, and they were a market leader in that space. And it just kind of made sense. And it's, you know, the fact that I was even able to franchise that segment for a major city like Houston was kind of luck because a lot of other people had passed on it because it didn't fit their business model at the time. So then by the time my mom saw it in the ad and by the time I reacted and the way the economic circumstances were that kind of allowed me to do it was pretty interesting because I never thought I'd be doing that. (laughs) What advice would you give your past self if you could do it all over again? You know, now I'm in a completely different business, but if I was doing that business, probably try to hire some more seasoned people in the beginning instead of trying to learn everything on my own was probably the biggest thing. I think we could have done things faster if we had the right people on our team. Instead of a team of one, uh, if we had a better management team, we could have done things differently. So you had the Sears franchise, and then you, like you said, stumbled across the Halal guys in New York City and now have that franchise. Tell us what attracted you to the brand of the Halal Guys and uh, a little more about what you all do. Yeah, it was 2013. I had been in business. I started Sears in 2009, late 2009. So in 2013, my wife and I go to New York City. We both hadn't been there. And we checked. our hotel was on 42nd Street. So 42nd is a very lively street in Manhattan. And our hotel wasn't ready. We walked outside to Times Square. We met some guy that was selling tickets to Broadway, to Matilda. I knew Matilda. I'd never been to Broadway. So we bought tickets, went to the show, came out of the show. And we're like, okay, well, we're hungry now. So I checked on my phone, like, what's the best place to eat? And it was Siri that said, you know, 53rd and 6th, the halal guys. And I was like, okay, cool. Let's check it out. It's like a few blocks up. We walk up, it's around 4 o'clock, 4.30, and there's a line of like 40 people. And we're like, it's a cart. So it's a street cart at the corner of 53rd and 6th. And there's a bunch of people online. It's not lunchtime. It's like in between time. <laughs> and uh, we stood in line. We, you know, got through it. And then we ended up going back like three times in a 24-hour span. And it was just everything about the food, the smell, the line, the hype, like everything that just the simplicity of it attracted us. And that's when I started emailing them. I was like, hey, guys, what if I franchise this in Houston? And they were like, no. (laughs) And we had a few more emails over the course of a year. and They consistently said no. At this point, I started, I was, the food industry kind of piqued my interest. I started looking more into other brands. It was everything you could think of, Dunkin', you know, all your major brands. I started looking into franchising. Came across one Elevation Burger, and they had already sold out in Houston. But the person that was affiliated with them was like, hey, have you heard of the Halal guys? They just started franchising. Maybe that's something you're interested in. And I was like, yeah, I'm interested. We set up a call. And one of the the people that was managing that process was like, hey, the founders of this company, they're going overseas like next week. So if you're trying to do this, if you're trying to do in franchising what's called a discovery day, you have to, it's like a legal thing. You have to go to a discovery day before you start the process. So at this point, I set up a meeting to meet them. We booked the flight. We get to New York. And the first question they asked me is, do you have any restaurant experience? And I said, I don't. But I also didn't have any garage door experience either. 
And at the time, the SBA had recognized me for Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2012. So we talked about that. We talked about processes. We talked about things and about building a team. And, and uh, they, you know, they liked it. So we signed a deal. So you so much so wanted to do Halal Guys that you were so persistent in reaching out to them. And it all comes together. You go to Discovery Day. You go through this process. Was there ever a time where you felt like, where you had doubts, where you weren't sure that you wanted to go through with the process? Yeah, 100%. When I came, came back from Discovery Day, I was talking to my parents and, and my wife. And I was wondering, like, will people in Texas eat this kind of food? Like, is this a thing? And... I was like, I don't know. So there was a week where I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just not going to do this because I don't, I don't think people are going to eat food <laughs> in Houston, Texas. And I was looking at this other franchise. It was a restoration franchise. So when your house burns down or when your whatever, your house gets flooded, you call these people that put, put your house back together. And I wrote out a check. The CEO for this company was going to meet me in Houston. It was, it, it was, I think it was fifty thousand or hundred thousand dollars at the time for like the deposit for all of Houston. And one of my mentors, Matt, Mike Ratchford, was in the area, and he calls me. He's like, "Hey, I'm around your office." I was like, "Hey, Mike, why don't you come by? I want to ask you something." He comes to my office, and this is my Sears office, and he's like, "Well, what's going on?" I was like, "Mike." I'm looking at this franchise. I'm the CEO is coming tomorrow. I'm going to do this deal. So I get your thumbs up on it. And by the way, there's this other sandwich thing from New York. And he was like, okay, well, let's talk through it. And when we did, at the end of it, he was like, you need to do the sandwich thing. We used to call it the sandwich thing. Halal Guys doesn't sell sandwiches. But he was like, you need to do something with a singular focus. And if you do the restoration thing, it's got mechanical, electrical, plumbing, roofing. There's too many different trades and you shouldn't do this. You should do the other thing. And I was like, Mike, the CEO is coming tomorrow. He's flying in from Arizona. And he was like, you need to learn how to say no. And you need to tell him that you can't do it. And, you know, I was, I was like, okay. I called the guy or I met him the next day. I was like, Hey man, I can't do this. I'm really sorry. I mean, I'll pay for your flight, you know, as if that mattered. <laughs> but um, like, I don't know how to make this right, but I can't move forward with this. And Mike Ratchford changed everything. And that company went bankrupt. Like not too, you know, a few months later, a year later, it was gone. So that was a, it was a, it was a big deal. That's amazing. And so there's multiple locations in Houston. Do you own all of them or do you just have Yeah. Those? So there's six locations in Houston. Um, originally, Houston was split into two territories. So I own five of the six, but have the development rights for the, for the balance of Houston going forward. Wow. That is a lot of locations to manage and, and a lot of growth in a, in a short period of time. Yeah. So at this point, I think it was... One of my mentors in Austin, Adnan Sattar, he was, he's a family friend and I think we were at some birthday party or something and I was, I was doing Sears Garage Doors and I was doing Halal Guys. So it was that year, like 2016, where all, both are happening together. And I was like, hey, I just have a question, man. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, should I do both of these? Should I, like, not do the restaurant? Like, what, what advice do you have? He's like, well, which one do you think has more growth potential and which one are you more passionate about? And I was like, well, the restaurants. And he's like, well, you need to pick one singular focus and you need to run with that. And that's when I decided I needed to sell Sears. And a year, not even a year, I think nine months after I made that intention, I sold Sears, successfully exited that business and strictly just focused on halal. and the. I think we built, by this time I had two units and we just doubled down and just kept going. That's incredible. What's the craziest thing that has happened to you as a restaurant owner? 
the absolute craziest thing was when my first restaurant almost burned to the ground. It was, it was like three months after we had opened. We still had a line like that came out of the door just a little bit. It's 12 o'clock. The landlord decided to redo the parking lot, put a new layer of asphalt. So they had shut down half the lot and they were working on the other half. I was outside directing traffic at lunchtime and I hear an explosion in the back of the building. And then it looked like July 4th fireworks in the back. Just, just, it was crazy in the back of the building. So I go walk and see what's going on. Because all I saw was sparks. And I see the back of the building had a fire, like where the electricity comes into the building. I immediately rush in, tell everyone to evacuate the building, grab a fire extinguisher and start putting out this fire that almost burned it down. We called the fire department. Every, you know, I tried to control the fire to the best of my ability. And uh, we were back open by dinner. But I always wonder if I wasn't standing outside, if I wasn't directing traffic, if the asphalt wasn't happening, <laughs> what would happen? So uh, pretty crazy uh, for us to come out of that. That is crazy. So now you're going into Elaine's franchise, right? Which is a dearly loved restaurant. Tell us more about Lane's. Yeah, um, Lane's. So I've been looking for, I'm always looking for different opportunities, different brands that make sense. And I like brands with a story. And like Halal Guys, you know, you remember traveling to New York. People remember the white sauce. They remember being in the city. And there's a lot of nostalgia with the food and the concept. So Lane's Chicken Fingers has a similar story. Like you're in A&M, it's everyone in A&M goes to Lane's. It's, it's a big deal. And there's a lot of Aggies in Houston. So I think what, I don't remember the exact day, but at some point I went to Lane's Chicken Fingers. I saw the little franchising tab on the bottom and I clicked it. And it said, not available in Houston. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I can email them and see what happens. And they were like, no. And then I think we had, like, over the course of, like, I don't know, two years, they were like, no, we're not. And I think, if I remember correctly, their story was that they were they were going to open stores in Houston in 2017. But then Hurricane Harvey hit and they decided to pivot and move, open their stores in Dallas. And that was just my luck because Houston was still open. So by the time the pandemic hit and in July, I think it was late at night and I'm, it was, I just decided, hey, let me check on them again. Let me see what's changed, you know, post-COVID or during COVID. And they said, you know what? Just yesterday, we're thinking about starting down our list of everyone that's reached out. And we're going to, and you had just emailed us. And I was like, I don't believe this. And they're like, no, really, this is, this is what happened. So they invited me to Dallas. We talked through it. You know, and they were like, you know what, if we're going to do this, we're going to, they saw my stores, they came down, saw how we operated and they're like, okay, we're going to do this with you. And that was a huge deal for me. That was uh, a huge deal. Like for me to, for them to look at my operations, to give it a thumbs up, to feel comfortable giving me what they originally wanted to do was, was, a, was a huge deal. So So now we're opening in in Katy. (laughs) It's incredible, too, because, I mean, there's a few really good lessons in your story. Like, be fine with being told no. (laughs) Continue to be persistent. Not that you, and it doesn't sound like you were annoying, but you were persistent. And then there's this magical right place at the right time stuff that you have going on, too, (laughs) which is also part part of success, for sure. It's a lot of that, you know, right place, right time. You know, they say, I forget the quote, but those who work hard or something like, if you're always, something about luck isn't, 
like luck comes to those that are always, you know, working hard or looking for something. So I think I've always been actively searching for either the right opportunity fueled by passion. That's like, hey, whether that's in food or whether that's in doors or whether that's, you know, at E and Y. It's just when you always have your, you know, that that drive to do something different, to do something better, then you end up in these scenarios where you're ready to receive that opportunity. Um, in this case, it was Lane's. Previously, it was the, you know, halal guys. Because uh, if I didn't have the garage door business, I don't know if I would have gotten halal guys. And then if I didn't have halal guys, I don't think I would have gotten to Lane's. So it just kind of carried up forward. Right. That's great. Let's move into rapid fire. What do you consider your most valuable failure? Failing early on in the restaurant, like, so we had opened Halal Guys with a four hour line. So on the outside, it was a success. We had a great line. Everything was great. But inside, it was, it was very chaotic. (laughs) And we, it was like getting punched in the face every single day. You'd wake up and you'd hear about something. And I feel like we just didn't have the right team at that time. And that was where I didn't have the experience. But the good thing was, if I had the experience, I'd probably jump in and not hire for that talent. Whereas in this case, I had to find that talent. And I almost quit the restaurant business because it was too, it was so crazy to where I was just like, God, if you want me to be in this business, I need some help (laughs) because I can't do this. And literally, like two days later or three days later, I get a call from New York and they're like, hey, we've got this guy. We just trained him. He's really good. But his dad lives in New York. He's thinking about moving. You know, he needs to go to go to go to Houston. Do you think you can hire him? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> I can hire him. And that, you know, he arrived to Houston, saw my operations, and he was like, okay, yeah, I'd like to work here. And his name was Carlos Martinez, and he's with me today. And within three months, he changed the trajectory of my operations and has allowed us to just grow and really have a just a great operations team now is that he's built together him and I, but a lot of the credit goes to him. And that was a failure that I guess turned into something else. So, yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. If somebody is thinking about uh, starting a franchise, what's the first thing they should do? First, find out what industry they're interested in. That would be number one, because you can franchise almost in any industry today. That would be the first step. And then be early. You know, look at brands that are thinking about franchising because that's really the key, I think. Or talk to brands that aren't franchising that may be thinking about it. (laughs) Or at least aren't thinking about franchising in the location where you want to be. (laughs) Right, right. Understand them, you know, like why, what, what, what are their, you know, what, what are their objections? But also be ready to receive that, you know, like, I think if I just came out of college and I just called somebody to franchise in a major market, they would probably say no. But when you, you know, kind of be have that timing right in your mind, like, do you can you receive this opportunity? Are you able? Are you well capitalized? Like, do you have the network to fund this deal? Do you have uh, the self ability to fund this deal? Do you have the do you have your network in this industry to where you could start hiring? That's key to like, you know, now that I've been in the restaurant industry for what, five, six years now, like there's people that you began to know and hear about and like people know about you. So like it's easier for you to hire within that industry. Whereas when you're brand new, you have, you're just, you know, you're relying on Indeed or at the time Craigslist to find your people. So, yeah, do your research in your industry, find that industry, be passionate about the industry, uh, be passionate about building something, and then find the brand that, that, that has a story. 
What has been your proudest moment in the past seven years as an entrepreneur in the food industry space? When we first hit 50 employees, that was a pretty big deal because previously we had like, I think, 20, 25 people at Sears. But when we hit 50, and then when we had, you know, five stores open just recently, we have more than 50 now, but it kind of was a, was a pretty big deal. And then now we have, you know, four restaurants under construction, potentially, you know, like they're either under construction or about to be. So we're going to go from five to nine was a moment of self-reflection that, hey, especially during COVID. And, you know, if we keep doing the right thing, if we, you know, stay focused, focus on the guest, focus on quality, focus on safety, cleanliness, we just kind of stay true to what we do in the restaurant business, we can really do great things. And um, the this year has been pretty, pretty amazing to just look back on uh, and be proud of what we've accomplished. So that's great. We end each episode with a good bull. This is an opportunity to recognize someone else for something good or great that they have done. Do you have someone you would like to send a good bull? One of my major influences at A&M was Dr. Schaub in the accounting department. I think he's now in charge of PPA. I think I read on his LinkedIn recently. He had a, an event at his house when school when we were graduating or right before, and we give out a little trophy, like kind of like high school. I don't know if he still does this or not, but uh, he gave me a trophy that said "most likely to make a billion dollars before realizing what he wants to do." And when I receive this, and now that I think about it, jumping from accounting to doors to restaurants, I wonder you know, what I'm going to do next. But it was a really major influence for me, receiving that so early on. I was like, I need to do something now. <laughs> so um, definitely really big amazing. thank you to Dr. Shab. I love that story. I'm so glad. And he'll hear that. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Ms. Orr, thank you so much for being here. It was so fun to have you on the show. We appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed that episode for our Mastercast top three takeaways. The first thing I'd like to touch on is the number of times that Masrur pivoted, saying no to the contracting franchise, selling off the Sears franchise, etc. Your thoughts? Yeah, I thought that was really inspiring and um, helpful for me. You know, it's there. I don't know that there's such a thing as passive income for an entrepreneur. It seems like you're constantly, constantly, constantly having to pivot and reevaluate. And that was definitely a, a takeaway for me in his episode. And not even some regards, some of those things were pivots. And some of those things seemed like, seemed developmental, like they were building on each other. You know, oh, I had this experience. I learned a lot here. And now next time I'm going to do this. Yeah. Which yeah. That's is definitely even true. Different than a pivot, right? A pivot would be like, oh, we're not doing well over here. I'm going to shift here. And it was cool to see. Sure. And I heard something yesterday about the first time you like if you're going to build a custom home don't plan to build the home that you want to live out your twilight years in because the first time you build a home like you can't possibly know all of the things that you will know the second or even third time that you build a home so a lot of people will say okay it's time for us to build a house thinking that that's going to be the house and so often th there's just a lot that you end up disappointed with so the process of just continuing to iterate, I think, is the, you know, is the big takeaway there. Yeah, that's interesting to think about from a business perspective, right? Like you're not necessarily building the business that's going to last you forever. You're building what you need now. I like that. I spoke with a, a therapist one time who said you should treat every relationship with respect, but also behave as though it is practice for the one that is going to last. And then if you're fortunate enough that this is the relationship that lasts, wonderful for you. That's cool. But uh, but I think the same, is, same is 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. For our second takeaway, in all cases, and you alluded to this on the show, Masrur heard no many times before he heard a yes. In business, no often means not yet. Shannon, you mentioned that he was persistent but not annoying. I make it my goal to be annoying but not persistent <laughs> yeah. whenever I can. I noticed. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh. I'm kidding. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think um I I think that is that is true for him. My my dad used to is in sales and his advice to us right. was always the proverbial the worst they can say is no and it has served me well in life. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh I I think that walking that line and figuring out and it, there's such a fine art to it and some of it is science but some of it is just kind of feel in terms of how much is too much how much is annoying and and sometimes it's okay to be a little bit annoying but you don't want to be too annoying which <laughs> is advice i just can't seem to get figured out for our final takeaway the thing i think restaurant owners are still getting wrong is trying to burn their locations to the ground i know everyone thinks this is good but i think it's i think it's bad and i think that this is still you know still a frontier in terms of don't burn your don't burn your location to the ground i can attest to that on a personal level like don't let your house burn down don't let your business burn down don't do it it's uh it's not going to be good for you now that we're far enough out from that unfortunate episode, like how how did your house fire get started? Do we do we have any idea how it happened? Oh uh, yeah, it was the uh, the fan in the bathroom. Like it just sparked or something. Yeah, they they get you should check your fans. Um, PSA: they get like dust and stuff on them, and that can eventually, if they spark, they can it can catch fire. It's pretty common. Actually, that when the like anybody came to our house related to the fire, the contractors, the fire investigator, everybody else, they were like, that was the first thing they asked. Was it a bathroom fan? Um, I mean, without seeing anything, they would oftentimes Mm. ask, was it a bathroom fan? Or sometimes we'd hear, uh, was your house struck by lightning? It was one of those two always first. We would say, so they would say, was it struck by lightning? We'd say no. And they would say, oh, was it a bathroom fan? Yes. And so they said, like, the four most common things are, lightning bathroom fan kitchen vent and dryer vent and so they were like yeah you should check those things all the time like who who's supposed to check like how do you how do you check them or who's supposed you, to check you them personally i don't know i don't know i don't know I'm if there's not like anywhere a near that handy i think we're gonna yeah we'll, we'll we'll contact our home warranty about it or something i don't think they're gonna help you <laughs> <laughs> well that's a whole other story uh-huh. there it is. uh anything else or should i close this with a quote Close us with a quote. There is only one way. Go within. Search for the cause. Find the impetus that bids you right. Put it to this test. Does it stretch out its roots in the deepest place of your heart? Brian Arilka. Thanks for listening. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help, whether that's from start to finish, fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted. Go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.